a very good morning to one and all here. A high note of expectation has been set, probably by the opening words of my friend Rajesh describing me as a star. Luckily, uh, uh, he didn't refer to it as a star that is eclipsed <laughs> or that had a meteoric fall. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, thanks for such beautiful words and describing me. Probably he referred to the upper portion of my body while he referred to my star because something is getting reflected. The aura, right? Ah, no, I, I have a small request to put before you. Uh, when I am described as a person of enormous capabilities, saying that, you know, what to say? Uh, a broadcaster, a voice caster, and uh, a teacher. Of all that, you know, my request is very simple that you have to bear in mind the fact that I'm not going to make a pompous parade of my erudition or scholarship here, uh, particularly relating to diaspora as a concept and diaspora theories. Uh, by making frequent references to frightening names like William Saffron, John Armstrong, Robin Cohen, Tolulian, and others, or, you know, yes, you know, post colonial theorists like Homi Baba, Gayatri Spivak, or Edward Said, and others. I, I, of course, you know, there will be occasions where I will recall these names and I will make a passing reference to some of the comments made by them. So please don't expect anything of an academic misadventure from my part. What I am trying to do is, just at least for the sake of clarity, clarity of ideas pertaining to the very concept of diaspora and the diaspora theories which has become part of colonial, post-colonial studies today and which has been widely discussed and debated upon, contested, negotiated widely, probably uh, there are uh, spaces of theorizing connected with this and those intricacies of theorizing wouldn't be the focus of my presentation. I would uh, briefly adumbrate or you know outline uh, the kind of lecture that I would like to or I plan to deliver to you. I would uh, begin with uh, you know uh, defining the concept of displacement in simple layman's language understandable okay this is I should not be charged with oversimplifying things you know or essentializing things or having a reductionist stance on that uh, but uh, I think uh, apart from the teachers and the research scholars who are assembled here uh, majority of the audience I think uh, happens to be students and therefore uh, for their understanding I will try to make a layman's presentation rather than delving deep into the uh, you know, theoretical part of it. My attempt would be to define the concepts of, you know, displacement, dislocation, or, uh, you know, probably I will not go into that, you know, terrifying concept of disjuncture of apadure. I will not go into that because that will be frightening and will take you, drive you out of your sense sometimes. Uh, after that, I will explain how displacement is connected with dislocation and how it has subsumed uh, under the study of diaspora, the broad category, the generic term diaspora, uh, I will not trace the origin because everybody here, I think, uh, you know, <laughs> know the genesis of the term uh, diaspora connected with the uh, Greek translation of the Bible and how people started scattering. And later, I would be trying to analyze or just, you know, uh, trace the trajectory of the development of displacement studies and the problem of displacement historically. I'm not a historian. I don't have any authenticity because history itself is metafiction as we know. Uh, so I don't believe in such grand narratives, but, you know, a simple mapping of, you know, the kind of discourses that emerged in, con in connection with displacement in general and uh, diaspora in particular will be the focus of my discussion going through the different you know typologies or what we call the morphology of uh, 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 the various types of diasporas that theorists have spoken about uh, I will start with the classical diaspora 
Yes, everybody knows it, the classical or the pre-modern diaspora beginning with the Jews, Armenians and the Africans. From there I will be moving to the second phase of diaspora, namely the colonial uh, diaspora. Uh, beginning in the 16th century with the Dutch, then the French, Portuguese, the English and you know other colonial powers and how colonialism has become something like you know uh, uh, a discourse that has justified or vindicated the claim of uh, displacement as a matter of right. Then the last phase I will be summing up with what has happened after colonialism came to an end, the post-colonial scenario, how displacement has affected us in uh, contemporary times. But I will, if time permits, I don't know whether I will be able to do that. If time permits, I will be winding up my, uh, my session with a presentation of Indian diaspora as of today, particularly with reference to the Indian diaspora writers, if time permits. Because uh, that will be of some use to students of, you know, uh, uh, literature, because how the diaspora writers, uh, how they are accepted, accommodated and appreciated worldwide today uh, in relation to the uh, legacy of the old generation of Indian diaspora writers, uh, you know, uh, who are believed to be uh, the inheritors of the endangered legacy or the plantation workers legacy. So this is how I plan my things. I think the plan itself is very complex, right? <laughs> is it very complex? <laughs> no, I don't ask questions because asking questions, you know, being a teacher who have been in the field of teaching for more than three, de three decades officially and unofficially, I, I am tempted to ask questions because, you know, Vijay Mashabandu, uh, is there anybody who can't understand Malayalam here? MN Vijay Mashabandu, Uru Udhahar a class in the other one, a little bit of 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 Illa bagi, adu untuk detailan korang perlu lo. Adanya mungkin yang ada itu untuk itu. Utteran kita ada aco diem, kelas muri ke poratum, agak tidak. Kelas muri ke poratum, varianda ini lom, candy ini lom, maracu botol lom, alanya tiringnya nada nu, enak. Right? Abang adu untuk ini aco diem jodoh dia. Something that we can't afford to expect, right? I think that the very plan, I just wanted to give you some idea about how I proceed in my presentation, the way in which I progress from uh, the early stage of diaspora to the final stage of Indian diaspora being honored worldwide today, which is something that is prestigious and that, that, that brings great esteem to uh, the South Asian diaspora in general and Indian diaspora in particular, particularly with reference to the Indian writers living abroad and writing. Well, so I will begin with a simple definition of displacement. When I say simple, the concept is not very simple. Displacement is not a very simple concept because it has an amazing degree of interdisciplinarity. In history, we study displacement. In sociology, we study displacement as a matter of mobility, horizontal as well as vertical mobility in sociology. Uh, how one can move from one stage of existence to another, maybe upward or downward. You know, that is an instance of vertical mobility. In anthropology, we study about how different, you know, uh, peoples I mean plural, peoples in different epochs moved from one habitat to another and the kind of changes that have happened to them. So there is an amazing degree of interdisciplinarity while we discuss the concept of displacement. And you know, as I told you already, it is closely connected to the concept of mobility, on the move. Remember that poem, okay. On the move. 
Uh, people are always on the move. When we talk about displacement, we are talking about a community or a group of people or individuals on the move. Right from, you know, Abraham in the Old Testament of the Bible, Ulysses in Homer, okay, you know, uh, uh, taking part in the Trojan War for long years and returning home, wandering, uh, you know, to come back to Ithaca to meet Penelope and his son Telemachus. Then there is Oedipus, the great, you know, Greek hero who was expelled from Thebes, wandering. And finally, we have the picture of the wandering Jews worldwide. Even today, well, gypsies, pilgrims, travelers, tourists, guerrilla fighters, Maoists in Orisha, and even in Kerala, some parts of Kerala, wandering minstrels or scopes or gleemen, as they were called by different names uh, during the ancient periods, you know, moving from one place, singing songs and uh, moving about. See, look at all these people. They were all displaced or dislocated people. Some had their own original home. Some didn't have any home at all. See, for example, nomads. They don't have a home to have a myth of returning. Because, you know, there are certain characteristics which are identified by theories about, you know, a diaspora. This myth of return, this myth of return and the existence of an imagined homeland. These two are cardinal these two are very important but for these people some people they are completely rootless completely rootless they were not uprooted they were not uprooted somebody can be uprooted only if they are rooted but some people like nomads they were never rooted but always all these categories of people they were always on the move so mobility and displacement are terms that are closely interconnected because displacement invariably leads to mobility or moving from one place to another maybe comfortably or with discomfiture right and this kind of displacement can take various forms say for example theorists have identified various kinds of displacement like migration or exile uh, or emigri emigre emigri or refugees, yes, we are today very familiar with the issue of refugees, the Syrian refugees. Uh, and also we have this problem in, uh, uh, you know, Asian communities. Then there is another category ba based on displacement described as expatriates. Expatriates, then nomads. But whenever we speak about these different categories of displaced people and communities we always keep in our mind the essential quality of a people moving from one place to another it may be due to external aggression or a war warlike situation when one country is attacked by another say for example the Aryan invasion in india it was an invasion when people they were forced to leave it could be the result of an external aggression or internal civil war typically characteristic of uh, african countries uh, always there are you know what is the internal bickerings and internal strife uh, but uh, you know i can give you some examples of internal as well as external problems uh, take the example of the liberation of bangladesh what was the immediate consequence of the liberation of bangladesh it resulted in an exodus of la or influx of large number of people, refugees, crossing the border to India. So we had to accommodate them. We had to accept them, the influx of refugees from Bangladesh. You take, uh, in 1972, Idi Amin, uh, the ruler of East Africa, you know, East African country, Uganda. What did he do? He declared a kind of ethnic cleansing. Ethnic cleansing. Uh, as a result, several Indians, millions of them, had to flee from Uganda to Britain. From there, finally, to America. And if you if you look at the uh, you know demographic profile of today's UK, there's an interesting statistic uh, that you know about one third of uh, the Indian diaspora now living in the UK happened to be people who fled from Uganda as a result of the ethnic cleansing. 
ethnic cleansing initiated by the Amin, the dictator. Right. Also look at the instance of terrorism in Kashmir and the pundits fleeing Kashmir. And now, uh, yes, paradoxically, paradoxically, the government has been uh, <laughs> saying that now the pundits can come back. Their home is ready. But we are not very sure that the pundits will come back in all probability. We do not know exactly whether they will return or not. But now Kashmir has been rendered their home. In fact, they return or whether they don't return is a matter that is yet to be discussed. Similarly, we have, you know, people moving right from the 1930s, 40s, 50s and 60s along with my ancestors from Central Travancore and Southern Travancore to Malabar right from 1930s. You can just imagine these are all, you know, uh, instances of people's moving. Probably com uh, there are the compulsions are different. The reasons are different. Maybe uh, uh, the migration of people to Malabar in, uh, the since 1930s could be thought of as something that was necessitated by the quest for survival. Uh, shortage of agricultural land and plenty of agricultural land was there and uh, probably uh, the socio-economic factors were predominant in such migrations or such movements. And another instance or another reason for displacement to take place could be, yes, uh, Suja ma'am has rightly pointed out, because of the developmental initiatives undertaken by governments. And the best example is Sarda, Sardar Sarova Dam, built across Narmada, Narmada Bachao Andolan. And we know hundreds of villages got inundated and they had to be evacuated without proper facilities of rehabilitating the people thus evacuated from the affected regions. So development can also be a contributory factor that may result in displacement of large number of people. Now, uh, I come to the uh, classical example. Uh, I, refer to, I refer to the three periods of uh, how displacement uh, now discussed under the broad rubric of, you know, diaspora uh, has evolved itself uh, through three different stages. The first stage is often referred to as the classical diaspora or the pre-modern diaspora, often referring to the hardships, torture, the cataclysmic events connected with the raising of the walls of Jerusalem by the Romans, Okay, in the 3rd century BC or something of that sort, I'm not very clear about the period or the year. And how the Jews were persecuted or how they were, you know, subject to traumatic events. And how, uh, you know, in a succession, they got dispersed or scattered uh, uh, to different parts of the world. Am I going very fast? Very slow? The ideal type? Thank you. All right. <laughs> well, uh, so it all began with this case of the Jews. You know, for uh, many uh, a long year, theories on displacement studies, they focused this as the prototype or the Jewish experience as the prototype of all diasporas. And only by the 1980s, uh, you know, realization dawned upon uh, the thinkers and theorists working in this area, domain of knowledge, that uh, this no longer holds valid to take this as the prototype of old diaspora, the Jewish experience, because the Jews were subject to different periods of torture, uh, latest by the Holocaust upon them by Hitler, Nazi Germany. So something, the traumatic event, which had its roots in, uh, in the prehistoric or pre-modern period, uh, continued until Hitler, until Hitler, the Jews. And thus we have today the, the concept of, you know, the wandering Jew. 
the wandering Jew has become a prototype as far as uh, we are concerned. And they always feel that they are always in exile. They are always in exile until 1978 when the Syrian kingdom was, uh, sorry, 1948 when the Syrian kingdom was divided by the British rulers before they left and thus created a separate state of Israel as the homeland for the Jews. Until then, they were always on the move. Always moving from place to place in exile, perennial exile. One should describe it as perennial exile. Well, so the second phase begins with colonialism. But when I say that, you know, uh, uh, displacement or uh, diaspora is a feeling of geographic dispersal. There are two levels of, you know, uh, diasporic experience. Uh, the one is, you are getting physically uh, moved from, uh, from one place, either voluntary or forced. We do not know. I don't go into the classifications. Some people volunteer to move as we have the present Indian diaspora moving to Canada or Australia or, uh, you know, uh, US for that matter. Uh, th th that can be described as a voluntary movement. So there is a geographical aspect of moving from one place to another and even while you are deeply firmly rooted in your own homeland uh, uh, one is likely to feel out of place how does it happen you have a sense that you are out of place even in your own place even in your homeland this is a very strange experience a sense of alienation that one feels you know uh, we feel this sense of a diasporic experience even while we are firmly rooted in our homeland. This could be attributed to what is happening to the world around us. I think you understand it. What is happening to the world around us. Today we feel it. Today I feel it. I don't know how many of you share it. The world, around has, the world around us has changed. And we feel uh, the so-called, you know, uh, diasporic experience of being out of place. When you say something, uh, 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 when you look around, you find that the world itself has undergone so much of change. The earlier people used to describe this kind of, you know, uh, psychic experience of being a diaspora as a generation gap when children grow when they start you know uh, presenting desiderata or prescriptions to the parents parents complained generation gap the world around us has changed we feel diasporic that is also there. So uh, there are two levels of experience of diaspora. But in our diaspora studies, the focus is essentially not on this kind of a traumatic experience that we feel even while we are firmly rooted in our homeland. But the studies concern themselves with the kind of trauma, the kind of torture, the kind of, you know, uh, rootlessness, uh, what Homike Baba calls, you know, the in-betweenness the uh, so-called third space we are getting trapped in that liminal space probably uh, this is the major concern of our discussion today okay uh, and I leave uh, the this kind of a rootlessness that we feel while being rooted in our homeland as not a subject fit for our studies called diaspora studies <laughs> okay well Colonialism, how did it thrive? Colonialism, it started in the early 16th century with the Dutch, the French and the English and others, okay. Uh, even before that, even before that we have, uh, yes, uh, many avatars of globalization. Uh, what uh, uh, Paranjabe calls it, many avatars of uh, globalization we had. I, I will uh, come to that later. Uh, how did globalization thrive? Globalization thrived on the principle of othering, creating the other. The colonizer colonized by an array. 
The colonizer is always held to be superior racially, at least racially, intellectually, in all matters, superior to the colonized. So, uh, the colonized were made the other. This process of othering and establishing a kind of moral superiority over the colonized has been the guiding principle on which colonialism thrived. It survived. Well, and if you look at this, we find as part of othering, there are certain binaries consciously created. Edward said makes a list of them. I, I, I don't refer to him. Of course, uh, I should acknowledge uh, my indebtedness to him. See, for example, the black versus white, the colonizer versus the colonized, the center versus the periphery, the center versus the periphery. These are all, you know, binaries created for the process of othering and making the colonized to feel inferior in all respects to the colonized. And if you look at uh, uh, the process, we find we are able to identify certain uh, power centers or centers of power connected with this process of colonialism. Uh, the first power center, which was very successfully, effectively, assiduously employed by colonial uh, powers, happens to be the census. The census. Taking a census and, you know, identifying people, classifying them, uh, uh, making a demographic profile or composition of uh, the country. So, the first tool used in the process of othering and expansion of colonialism happens to be the census, which is a socio-metric device. Okay? Creating a matrix, creating a social matrix. The second is the cartography, drawing of maps. Drawing of maps of different nations. Probably this has created uh, what is called the wrong notion of the so-called nation state. Drawing of maps, fixing boundaries, okay, McMohan line and other lines. Well, and finally there is the museum where you can find very strange people, Africans or Negroes. You might have uh, studied in British history during the uh, Tudor dynasty. <coughs> uh, it was Edward the first, I believe, that uh, uh, you know first ordered the Jews to be sent away from the London city, and uh, they were forced to stay only in the far-flung suburban areas of London. And later, with the slave trade in progress. After Sir Francis Drake, uh, you know, completing that circumnavigation, uh, returning home with uh, enormous wealth. How did he mobilize this wealth? Through slave trade. And after all this, we can find that, you know, there were instances of the blacks, the blacks or the Negroes that's brought to England. Some of them, some of them, very few of them could enter the household of Queen Elizabeth even, uh, you know, as uh, maid in waiting, as maid in waiting, or maybe as uh, doing some menial jobs in the court. But there is an interesting incident noted by, uh, yes, uh, Stephen Greenblatt in uh, this Renaissance self fashioning uh, that the Prince of Wales, uh, some Prince of Wales, <laughs> not the present one, yes. Uh, the, the occasion was the marriage of the Prince of Wales, and uh, for the marriage celebration, some uh, chariot was to be drawn, originally planned to be drawn by horses or elephants. Because they were all, you know, the signs of extravagance. But Prince of Wales, all on a sudden, insisted that instead of the horses or the elephants, the chariot should be driven by Negroes. And two Negroes drove the chariot in extreme cold conditions. And when the celebration was over, their bodies were found dead on the floor. This is beautifully given uh, by Greenblatt. 
the kind of renaissance England, the kind of slave trade and how the blacks were uh, used uh, for entertainment and as a sign of, uh, you know, something uh, to be looked at and enjoyed, to be looked atness. <laughs> okay, yes, exactly, something to be looked at as curios, black figures. So, the third thing, uh, the process of othering made use of in expanding or sustaining c colonialism was the first thing was the census, the second thing was the map and the third thing was the museum. They have become, they have become the empirical evidences of social, geographical and cultural belonging in the post-colonial world. This has been stated by none other than Benedict Anderson, talking about the so-called imagined communities, imagined communities. These three have become emblematic of, you know, the post-colonial world, evidences, empirical evidences, which were used very successfully by the colonial masters. Sorry to make a reference to theories, Homi Ke Baba also talks about the poetics of exile, the rather grim prose of political and economic refugees characterizing the post-colonial history. Look at those expressions only, beautiful expressions, therefore I just wanted to reproduce them. The poetics of exile and the rather grim prose of political and economic refugees which are characteristic features of the post-colonial history or post-colonial world. Of course, it goes without saying that colonialism <coughs> resulted in large-scale migration either forced in the form of slavery or exile or voluntary, okay, on their own volition, on their own volition. Say for example, soldiers moving from one place to another. And the indentured plantation laborers, we know about this. The indentured or on contract basis, you know, laborers were employed on large scale by the Dutch, the French and the English. In fact, the Indian indentured workers or plantation workers working mostly in the Caribbean and places like Fiji, uh, Mauritius, Trinidad and other places who are supposedly the ancestral diaspora of the present Indian diaspora. Uh, you know, uh, okay. So that could be thought of as something like uh, voluntary migration, not forced migration. So soldiers moving from one camp to another or indentured workers or contract laborers moving from one place to another uh, cannot be thought of as forced displacements. Even though there is, an, there is an element of force or coercion being used in the indentured workers' history, if you study history properly, uh, look at the process of recruitment of laborers. Because uh, it was from 1853 to 1917. Because 1917 was the year when the practice was stopped. The indentured workers' practice was stopped in 1917. It was abolished. And so from 1853, uh, Lord Delousey, 1853 to uh, 1917, if you look at this period, we find the Indian uh, indentured workers' diaspora in existence mostly by the English people, mostly by the English people. Before that, right from 1615, in early part of the 17th century, we have the Dutch imposing indenture and then uh, the French imposing indenture but the Indian diaspora, indenture diaspora emerges only after the British started recruiting and employing large numbers of Indian laborers, plantation laborers for the plantations in their colonies from 1853 to 1917. Well, so there could be two types of displacement one is called voluntary the other is called forced migration or fo forced you know displacement and now when we come to the third phase 
The third phase is the post-colonial phase, the end of colonialism and the beginning of the newer phase called globalization in the 90s. Uh, I am just trying to identify the three phases, then uh, we will discuss the uh, other areas connected with the three movements towards, uh, you know, uh, or in the second half of my presentation. So, uh, we move from colonial uh, diaspora to the period of, you know, post-colonial diaspora and then to globalization and post-globalized world. You know, when we talk about the endangered workers or when we talk about the colonial diaspora, we actually talk about the movement of a particular kind of capital. There's a very interesting uh, statement made by Brazil. Uh, Brazil writes, uh, during the colonial period, many items were sold, say for example, say for example, capital goods, capital goods, you may understand what is meant by that, capital goods, gems, jewelries and slaves. And slaves, they are all equated as, equated with commodities on sale. This was the period called, uh, you know, the uh, colonial period. But when we uh, enter the colonial period, we find that the capital that was always on the move was named the merchant capital, which was a term employed by, uh, yes, the British rulers, the merchant capital. A merchant company was formed. And permission was charter, was issued to them for trade. And thus, East India Company was established. Later, you know, they started finding or identifying, you know, sea route to India, sea route to Africa, Columbus going one side, Vasco da Gama moving to this side, another man reaching Goa in the same year, okay? Uh, uh, Amerigo Vespucci reaching that place and, you know, calling that unidentified place, America, probably, <laughs> resulting in a lot of confusion. The exploration, identification of sea routes to different parts of the world, all taking place during the Renaissance uh, period, exactly created the movement of a particular kind of capital called the merchant capital. Because the capital, standing for capitalism, was represented by one class named the merchant class. They were merchants, in fact. And the merchants, they wanted to generate profit and so the merchant capital started uh, being in circulation during the colonial period. But when we move to the post-colonial period, another kind of capital replaces the merchant capital. Any guess? Oh, question. Sorry. Um, <laughs> another new kind of capital has replaced the old merchant capital. What is it? called? What is it called? It is called simply late capital. Late capital. What is this late, late capital? It is characterized by the uncertainties of the market and the uncertainties of the nation state. This kind of a new capital which is characteristic of post-colonial uh, period is connected itself with uncertainties of market. You cannot predict market. And also it is connected with uncertainties of na nation state. Probably you can lose your identity any time when this capital starts moving. We in simple language refer to early modernism and late modernism to refer to these two periods when the merchant capital moved freely during the colonial period and the late capital used to move freely after the post-colonial period. We will have more of this discussion after uh, you know identifying the phases. We will come to this post-colonial scenario or the globalized scenario of diaspora in my discussion. But as I mentioned earlier, when we talk about the end of colonialism or the emergence of post-colonial world, 
and the opening up of the world, the so-called global village and uh, globalization, we have to bear in mind that there were uh, some uh, traces of prototypical traces of globalization which existed even in uh, you know the classical period say for example a new world order similar to the so-called globalized world was in existence even centuries before the first one is the holy roman empire which started spreading all across the globe almost you know three-fourths of the whole world was under the holy roman empire which was later replaced by the ottoman islamic state the ottoman empire the islamic world the first was christendom the second was islamic world the ottoman empire ottoman empire frequently attacked from the east by the mongols and by the crusaders who were passing through this place you know the crusaders did the greatest damage to the ottoman empire millions of people were killed it is given to understand that millions of people of the Turkish uh, Ottoman Empire got killed by the Crusaders. They could very simply resist the attack of the Mongols from the east. But it was more dangerous to resist the attack unleashed by the passing Crusaders, okay, the Christians. But with the discovery of America, and the so-called explorations, finding of new sea routes by the end of the 15th century or the turn of the 16th century, a new world order has come into existence which we refer to as the colonial world. The era of colonialism has begun. The era of colonialism has something very fascinating about it because it cannot be thought of as a monolithic entity in itself. It was rather a combination or a mix of several things. Say for example, it contained elements of imperialism. I'm afraid I'm talking high theory. No, I'm not. I, I have no intention. But by accident, if I do, please remind me. Please give a warning. Okay, right. I don't intend to talk high theory. Um, uh, if something is unintelligible, please tell me. I can stop. Because I have plenty of time. Hmm? And uh, we have got some matter to discuss, that's all. Well, it was not a monolithic entity. When we talk about colonialism, it cannot be thought of as a monolithic entity. It contained elements of imperialism. Yes, that is understandable. Then, by the end of the 18th century, there was the Industrial Revolution taking place in England. As a result, we can say that imperialism got clubbed or got combined or got fused with industrialization. Thus colonialism and early modernity encompassed imperialism, industrialization and the so-called merchant capital besides. Everything, everything came together during this colonial period. So look at the scenario, the first a uh, globalized world was represented in antiquity by the Holy Roman Empire, then replaced by the Ottoman Empire. Then with the emergence of colonialism, uh, we have this colonial world coming into existence with elements of combined elements of imperialism, industrial revolution and industrialization, followed by the merchant capital, particularly connected with the British merchant capital. If we look at the post-colonial world and if we focus more upon the final phase of diaspora connected with globalization, we can discern or identify certain major migration patterns or displacement patterns or movement patterns. We have entered the final phase, post-colonial or the globalized phase, where we can identify certain Patterns, regular patterns and movements. Say for example, I can identify, no sorry, somebody has identified for me. Uh, I, I cannot identify myself. Uh, five patterns of movement. The first movement is from Asia to the US and Canada. You know, the destination countries or what we call the host countries. Home country? Host country, right. The host countries or the, you know, uh, 
favorite destinations were US and Canada. So people from Asia started moving to the US and Canada. Secondly, people from Central America moving to US and Canada. So Asians moving to US and Canada. People from Central America, Brazil, Argentina and all that, you know, people moving to US and Canada. Then people of African origin moving to Europe, moving to Europe, okay, we will talk about uh, uh, the transatlantic, the black Atlantic of Paul Gilroy later, when we talk about the slave trade of African Negroes, well, how Atlantic, Atlantic route, the middle passage, what is known as the middle passage connected with the Atlantic Ocean has become the venue of the most serious, deadly of all trades in the world, the slave trade. Some 12 million uh, African slaves were shipped off in chains during uh, some 300 years uh, for this slave trade. Well, now the third is African people moving to Europe. The fourth pattern in the post-colonial world is Asians again moving to Europe. Now look at Asians' omnipotence or omnipresence, better say. You know, uh, Asians first moved to US and Canada and now Asians moving to Europe. And the fifth pattern is very interesting. That is very typical of we Malus. Okay? The Indian people and the Southeast Asians moving to a favorite destination. Ah, 1970s. The Middle East. The Middle East. So in the globalized world or the post-colonial world, these five patterns of, uh, you know, uh, movements or migrations could be easily cataloged or can be identified. As a result of these migrations, who are the beneficiaries, who are the sufferers, uh, that subject will be dealt by economists, not by uh, students of English literature uh, but we will have to have a look at the kind of consequences these large-scale migrations produced on the settler nation I mean the destination uh, say for example uh, US Canada Australia Europe or Middle East what consequences were produced upon the uh, settler nation or the uh, so-called host country there was serious shift in the demographic profile of the settler nation. As we all know, Canada has, you know, is a very sparsely populated country. It still encourages skilled migration. Skilled migration, remember, these are all terms to be reckoned with. Skilled migration, not all and sundry. Only skilled people can migrate, they are encouraged. And this is one of the reasons why Indian esteem has gone up in recent years. Only skilled people go abroad. We were all very matre porto to Bonulu. It's a bodo, velu, or color matre, veli bonula, and uncle veli put it repaired only with a pair lingu. And even a largo in the Javello, our Anganella, and what a chelano then with a minimum density rate on the other lorca matre gary bomba to the loo. This is the problem. This is an advantage. So it has created the, you know, the large scale migration of people from different parts, say from Asia, Central America, Africa, India and Southeast Asia uh, has resulted in what is called a shift in the demographic profile of the host nations or better say the settler nations. Of all these countries, of all these destinations, today, as per you know the latest uh, estimates available, America happens to be the largest settler nation by uh, by the first decade of the 21st century. I mean the new millennia. America happens to be the largest settler nation in the first decade of the new millennia. Now look at the story of our people. I mean, Asians and Southeast Asians in particular. The entry to the US for Southeast Asians was under control, under check. It was allowed only in 1965. 
the entry. The entry of other communities were allowed earlier. But the entry of Southeast Asians or South Asians was permitted to the US only since 1965. And if you look at today's demographic profile of the US, it is amazing to find that about 70% of the immigrant population 70% of the immigrant population from different parts of the world to the US have settled in six states of America, the US. Only in six states there is a clustering. Which are the two, uh, six states? I can name. New York, California, Illinois, Texas, Florida and New Jersey. Does it have any implication? These are the six states where you know, the migrants from different destinations to the U.S., about 70% of them are clustered in these six states. Does it have any implication? Does it mean anything else? Yes, it means. Because these are the six states which are technologically the most advanced and leading in the service sectors of the United States of America. Which gives us a clear indication that most of the migrants to these places, these six states, New York, New Jersey, Florida, Illinois, California and one more, Texas. It reveals the fact that these states are technologically the most advanced of all the states in America where these diaspora could make an entry. It also shows or it sheds useful light on the kind of the quality of the diaspora into these states. They are all technically qualified people reaching these six states of America. Look at the other instance because you know we uh, I have taken only two examples. One is uh, America, United States of America uh, to talk about the post-colonial uh, period and the other is Britain. After the Second World War, migration in large number of people from the colonial nations or the colonies, the erstwhile colonies, was made possible only after the Second World War. South Asians were permitted to enter Britain only in 1948. But when they were permitted, Caribbeans, Indian and African settlers they had to face, in the early stages of their migration to the UK, they had to face bitter racial discrimination. But later with the passage of, you know, anti-racist acts in the UK, you know, there was an easing of the situation. Racial discrimination slowly eased off. And the signing of the GATT, the General Agreement on Trade and Tariff, yes, which paved the way for globalization, and the consequent globalization forced Britain to leave discriminatory practices. London, if you, if you look at London today, it is one of the most cosmopolitan cities of the world, which is very much noted for being the most multicultural of all capital cities of the world, multi-ethnic. The examples of, these two examples of US and Britain highlight that displacement has become an unavoidable phenomenon in contemporary society. There is something very interesting. Earlier it was something forced upon people. If you look at the uh, classical cases, it was something that was forced upon people against their will. But today, in the post-colonial world, it is something that has become unavoidable. Crossing the border is no longer a traumatic experience. It has become something like an ecstatic experience. We cannot any longer talk about victim diasporas or labor diasporas or trade diasporas as Robin Cohen would do. Rather, we should today talk about, you know, people crossing the borders with a great degree of ecstasy because that marks out a new life for them. That marks out uh, social mobility and something like empowerment, something like empowerment. Well, therefore, today to define a nation, yes, this is the problem, nation. Okay. 
Therefore, today to define a nation, one has to look at the many displaced populations living within a geographical area. If you, if you talk about India, uh, and if you want to define India as a nation, you don't have to look upon a homogeneous group of people called Indians here. But you will have to look at a variety, a baffling variety of displaced peoples living within a geographical space. Say, if you take the Indian case, ever since the Aryan invasion took place, later came the Greeks, the Macedonians under Alexander the Great, spread of Islam and ousting of Parsis from Persia, and the Parsis came in last number to India, okay, from Persia to India. Then the Arab traders came, then the Persians, Afghans, Turkish traders, Mughal invasion occurred, the arrival of the Portuguese, the Dutch, the French and the English finally, the Jews in large number, Nepalese, Bangladeshis, all came to India. Therefore, to define a nation today needs to define a variety of displaced people living within a geographical boundary called India. It is not simply defining Indians. It is no longer a matter of defining the people of a particular country as people belonging to that country, but a variety of displaced communities living together. But India had this, yes, noble tradition of assimilating and accommodating all these vast and varied traditions and cultures into our social ethos and we, we could retain, you know, at the same time uh, they could retain the people who came to us, they could retain their distinct cultural in, insignia and at the same time uh, India could assimilate them into the main fold. Well, now uh, since I have very limited time at my uh, disposal, I would uh, wind up this discussion with what is called, I, I, I actually plan to give uh, something like the theorizing connected with making distinctions between exiles, refugees, expatriates and nomads given by Edward Said, but I leave that because exile, a person can be defined as an exile when he has no chance of returning to his homeland, returning to his homeland. Whereas an expatriate, expatriate uh, uh, has a chance to return, has a chance to return to his homeland. If at all this myth of return and the so-called homeland are closely uh, connected with the essential uh, characteristics of a diaspora. Okay. Uh, of course, there are other theorists like Ashcroft uh, who defines diaspora not merely in terms of geographic dispersal but in terms of identity, memory and home. Identity, memory and home. Generally now it is accepted that diaspora doesn't include all geographical dislocations or displacements but only those instances of deterritorialized, dispossessed and displaced communities. Remember the three expressions. Not all. Uh, say, for example, my, my journeying from Trivandrum yesterday to reach Ernakulam here for this session itself was a traumatic experience as far as I, um, you know, as an individual is concerned because all the way I was thinking about how my daughter will be brought to school tomorrow, who will be assigned the task of that, who will take care of this and that at home. So, that cannot be taken as part of diaspora studies. Not all geographical dislocations can be thought of as coming under the ambit of diaspora studies. Only those instances of deterritorialized, dispossessed and displaced communities cut off from their homes, customs, protectorship and citizenry or citizen rights. Only these cases can be now discussed under the rubric of diaspora studies. I come to uh, the Indian uh, diaspora th that will be uh, yes. The Asian diaspora, I will begin with Asian diaspora and with this I will end my discussion. The Asian diaspora, contemporary Asian diaspora and their unique status among the host nations in aiding the growth of a cosmopolitan world has been emphasized by theorists. See, for example, it is all because of 
certain particular categories being encouraged to migrate. The migration of highly qualified doctors, engineers, etc. And, and now I uh, give you an example. When we talk about Sony, make believe. Right? Sony, the brand. Samsung. Ang Lee, Jet Li, Mississippi, Masala, Miranair. Now all these exactly symbolize not Asia, symbolize the West. These are all contributions made by the Asian diaspora. And if you look at the Asian diaspora writers, we have V.S. Naipur, Salman Rushdie, Hanif Qureshi, Kasu Ishiguro, the Japanese writer than Will Avina. All these people have made, made attractive and, you know, uh, contributions to the Asian identity being projected as something that is to be appreciated worldwide. The study of South Asian diaspora was much neglected until recently. You know, uh, people started studying about the classical diasporas, all were talking about Jewish diaspora, talking about African slave diaspora, endangered diaspora, but the South Asian diaspora has gained attention only in recent times, say by the turn of the new century, I mean 21st century. Uh, you know, this uh, Asian diaspora is unique from the rest of the diasporas because they have no myth of the return to home because they have already an established home. They were never uprooted from their homes. They already have a home and they don't have any so-called myth of return to a homeland. They have uh, diverse origins, Koreans, say for example, Chinese, Lebanese, Indians, you know, diverse origins. And they never form a separate unity called South Asian diaspora. They retain their individual features. They never become a unit. They never become a unit. Their distinctive differences are kept alive. Probably based on religion, region and language, these differences were kept alive. One of the reasons why the South Asian diaspora as a generic term has never been seriously discussed. But that was a certain advantage to the South Asian diaspora. You know, only with the emergence of a transnational public sphere since the 1990s. What do you mean by that? Yes, we all know transnational public sphere. With the introduction of the so-called internet, Mira Nair's films, or probably, you know, Shyamalan, Manoj Shyamalan's films, fashion industry, internet, literature, music. Only with this, which are, you know, which are all, uh, you know, together, which are all together referred to as the transnational public sphere, that people all on a sudden came to know about a separate diaspora named South Asian diaspora through films, through music, through other contributions. I end my discussion with uh, the Indian diaspora writers as of today. The Indian diaspora, Asian diaspora, Indian diaspora. The Indian diaspora is remarkable not only by its size, it is very huge in its size number, but by achievements as well. Uh, a new form of self-fashioning, yes, self-fashioning was happening among the Indian diaspora. You know, a report said that of all the ethnic groups living in the U.S. today, the one ethnic group with the highest life expectancy was by the Indian diaspora. 89.3 years, the highest life expectancy. That is one great achievement. Only 4% of the U.K. population is constituted by a so-called Indian diaspora, but they contribute more than 10% of the total economic output of the UK. Okay. And if we look at the two uh, periods, uh, we have uh, an old Indian diaspora and a new contemporary Indian diaspora, the old represented by scientists like, yes, Chandrasekharan and Hargobind Khurana in science, 
uh, Naipol and Rushdi in literature, Lakshmi Mittal in UK with big business, steel business, Meera Nair and Manoj Knight Shyamal and Subin Mehta in music, the others in film industry. These are, you know, these are all some celebrities connected with the Indian diaspora as it exists today. Uh, the old generation diasporic writers like Raja Rao, Nirat C. Chaudhary, Ved Mehta, Kamala Markandeya, all these people, you know, they looked back at India. This is a very amazing thing. They all, after reaching these uh, foreign lands or host lands, they looked back at India, nostalgically recollecting India, as if they came to know about India only when they were out of India. As an outsider only, they could look upon India. But look at the new Indian diaspora writers, there is a sharp difference in their attitudes. You know, the older generation writers, whose names I have mentioned, they never uh, recounted their experiences as expatriates. Well, they remained outsiders and looked uh, longingly, nostalgically, from an outsider's perspective to India. But the new diaspora is different from the old diaspora. They too write about the nation imaginary. They too write about the nation imaginary. But the tone is only elegiac, not nostalgic. The tone is only elegiac, not nostalgic. Anita Desai, <coughs> Bharati Mukherjee, Amitav Ghosh, Shashi Tharoor, Vikram Seth, Jumba Lehri, all made their names, all could uh, you know, carve a niche for themselves only during the stay abroad, not while in India. They all could carve a name for themselves only when they were abroad, not in India. And uh, I end with this final, uh, you know, classification of the two groups of new diaspora writers. One, uh, you know, the first group is constituted by some writers who spent some years in India, then took their baggage and left India for some foreign destination. They spent some years in India. So they carry with the memories of India. And the uh, you know, the, the second category of uh, contemporary diasporic Indian writers are people of Indian origin, born and brought up outside of India. They don't have any, uh, any Indian experiences. The second category writers, they do not have any Indian experiences. Uh, there are some writers of, of both the categories. I mean... Uh, the contemporary uh, as well as the old diasporic Indian writers who wrote exclusively on Indian subjects while some wrote exclusively on subjects or themes concerning the life of the foreigners in the host land or in the uh, host nation. See for example the Golden Gate by Vikram Seth is about the life of not Indians in America but Americans in America. Even though certain Indian characters emerge so some started writing mostly, or most Indian diasporic writers, contemporary diasporic writers, they focus or they choose characters or, you know, uh, subject or themes from Indian life, while some specialize even on writing on European characters and themes and, uh, you know, even uh, other host nations. Well, this is uh, what I... This is not what I intended. I just uh, intended uh, of doing something more in between. But uh, I leave that aside. Please, I, I will wind up one uh, with one statement from uh, Makarant Paranjbe. With the statement, I think uh, uh, you may get an idea about how uh, things have transformed or evolved through various phases of development of diaspora right from the classical diaspora of the Jews, Armenians and Africans, slave trade, then from colonialism, then post-colonial and the globalized. These are the four uh, uh, areas I have touched upon. I shall end my presentation with this uh, statement from Magrant Paranjpe. M.K. Gandhi, that is Mohandas Karanjant Gandhi, became a Mahatma not in India. Not in India, but among the endangered plantation laborers in South Africa. Because he fought for their rights as a barrister, as an advocate. He became first an activist among the endangered workers, the plantation workers in South Africa. 
So I think I have given you some ideas about uh, the kind of you know evolution of the concept of diaspora, of the phases through which it has passed. And if that is fruitful, I thank God and I thank all the people who have assembled here. Uh, and I extend to my heartfelt, uh, sincere thanks to uh, the Department of English of Maharaja's uh, College, Autonomous College, right? Uh, uh, for inviting me to uh, give a, a short lecture on this subject. And I thank all the uh, Chodi and all the members. Besides, I, uh, in absentia, I uh, <laughs> express my gratitude to the principal and the college authorities. And I uh, uh, thank all of you for, uh, you know, listening to me at, you know, for a more, than a, more than 90 minutes, more than 90 minutes. Uh, I do not know, uh, maybe floods, the recent floods have taught us to be a little more patient. And I appreciate your patience and I thank you for listening to me. Thanks a lot.